Hey there, welcome to the Love Fly Fear of Flying Q and A. I'm Paul Tizard. I am one of the behind the scenes people, one of the admins here at the Love Fly team. Welcome to this weekly Fear of Flying doodah. What's the word? Q and A. That's it. So thank you very much for all the questions that have been coming through. Before we get going, first things first. A welcome to all our new members. That are joining uh, new people on Instagram, new people in the Love Fly Facebook group, and some new followers on our Love Fly team YouTube channel. So that's great to see. So thank you very much. Keep that coming. Keep recommending it as well because we always check when people sign up to see where they've heard from us. And quite often it will say, it might say on Google or we've seen it on Facebook or we've seen it on the Virgin Atlantic website or somewhere like that. But many, many people, it says recommended by somebody. So we don't know who those somebodies are half the time. But thank you very much. So brilliant. And uh, so this episode, we're going to go through a few questions that have come in, which have been brilliant. Uh, absolutely brilliant. Some real corkers there. So we're going to go through those. Um, I will keep an eye out to see if anything else comes in. But mostly I'm going to go off what's already been published. So uh, a little up. So the podcast this week at Wednesday, 0700 UK time of the Love Fly podcast, which you can get on if you haven't found it yet on Spotify and Google and Amazon and lots of other places. Uh, this week, it's the end of year review. So there is John, uh, Pete, Pete again, so John Bond, who both people you'll see in the group, Susan Mundrum, you obviously see posting a lot, and uh, me and Sarah Fowler. Sarah's also I just literally been posted an answer in this Q&A, so you might have seen that. I asked her to comment on one of the questions that came up, and which I'll paraphrase shortly as well. So check that out. There's, we try and do a, get a podcast out every week. We've got quite a few now in the can, as they say. But if you've got a story you want to share, people love stories. Well, you know, personally, I love the fear of flying stories. Although it's great to get the pilots on, and I know the feedback is always good. We like the pilots, we like the cabin crew, we like the technical humans. But we'd like to broaden it. Our mission when we started Love Fly was to think about the, the love of flying, you know, modern aviation and what all the great stuff it gives us. And that extends to not just getting over fear of flying, but just embracing this ability to be able to do stuff, which for generations, many people haven't been able to do. You know, it's in the last couple of generations, really, where it's become very, very affordable and you can get so many places so easily. And uh, it just opens up our world and our horizons and all the rest of it. And so we just trust around the board. So we like people who've got all sorts of stories about their travel, beating their fear of flying, but also we're, we like people who work in the industry. So we're getting more and more. John Bond is like the the demon on that at the moment. He's chasing people down all over the place. So we've got lots of really interesting guests coming up to back up all the fantastic ones we've had so far. We're up to nearly 160 episodes now, which is just amazing. Uh, what else is coming up? So the other news, we've got two things that have been launched uh, this week. Uh, one is uh, a, a proper launch. So it's our face-to-face -face course, our first face-to-face -face course for a while. We've done webinars for quite a while, but a first face-to-face ground-based course up in Manchester on the 13th of April. And there's only 20 places. Well, in fact, there's only 18 now. So today, it's only open today. We've had two bookings already. So that's uh, fantastic. And it's going to be a great day. And I'm not I'm not saying that because of being <laughs> immodest. I just know that you know, having run Fear of Flying courses for 20, oh my goodness, 26, 27 years, I know what people want. And I've got brilliant people working with me who know their onions, which is a good thing. And these people are just fantastic. So we're going to give you a great day. And we know that it's going to be a really good day. But also you've got all the equipment there. So the, the premises that we're using that Sky People in Manchester has just got, you know, it's got like an aircraft, on, you know, like an aircraft mock-up on the ground. So it's exactly like uh, it's an aircraft, basically. Just You just go in there and you've got all the seats. You've got a galley. And so we can sit in there, be in the environment. We've also got working doors. You can see all the equipment. You can see the slides that come out of those doors, you know, when they open the doors up, uh, the slide rafts. So all of that you can see, touch, look at. 
And I think that's going to be a, a really great day. But it's meant to be a culmination of lots of other stuff that we do. We don't want people coming along to it who have never heard of us. We want people we know. And so we will, when anyone who joins us, we'll get some information sent to them and some recommended podcasts. And we say, don't, you know, don't just turn up. It's not a one-stop shop. We see it as like the finale to a lot of work because we don't believe in kind of just ticking a box when it comes to beating the fear of flying. Well, if you want to do anything, you know, if you wanted, I always say this, if you wanted to get a good body, <laughs> you would go to the gym and once and go, where is it? You'd, you'd have to put the time in, wouldn't you? You'd have to, you know, you'd have to give it at least 30 days, maybe even longer, you know, a continued daily effort of, you know, changing some habits. And that's the way that we approach. And that's what a lot of the research suggests around beating a fear of flying or changing any habit is continued effort, chipping away a little bit by little bit. So that's why we'll, people that come on the face-to-face -face course will get sent our free copy of our webinar that we used to sell which is nearly three hours of content we'll get recommended podcasts we're going to make contact with you as well to make sure that you're ready for the day because we want you to come along and get the most from the day so that you can go and take flights when you're ready and, and that's how we started the virgin flying without fear courses in 1997 it's exactly for five years we never used aircraft we just used mock-ups and even hotel rooms you know and just but when people get the information that they need and they're primed, we didn't have any of the stuff that we've got now in terms of the podcast and all the pre-work and stuff. So I know it's going to be a great day. So come and so whilst there's still places left, come and join us. We've made it as easy as possible. We tried to keep the price competitive. We've done a couple of arrangements so you can pay it through Klarna, which means you can kind of pay in installments or. Uh, buy now pay later also you've got a paypal set up as well you can pay later on that one so you can do that and secondly if you're worried about oh it's not near enough to me we've we've managed through sky people to get a discounted deal with a local hotel which is literally 10 minutes away so there's no reason not to come and join us you know and it was going to be a fantastic day and we want to run many more of them not just in manchester we've got other locations as well but we're just trying to sort out the right facilities because it's got to be really high spec stuff and uh, yeah so that's that the other thing that's launched this week which has been um we've been doing it for many years but we've just redone it now is we do a one-to-one -one course a, a completely bespoke thing so if you want that individual attention and you want to spend some time with us individually you know and you're you know you're not too worried about the, the budget side of it so let's put it that way then we also run programs courses whatever you want to call them but a bespoke offering for you and we've managed to get some arrangements which are much easier now so if we if you want to do a flight a company flight we can do that of course that's easy to do but we also managed to get some commercial spec simulators that the pilots use you know so they're that standard and you'll have two pilots with you on the day plus us as well and we can do a two hour to whatever hour session in the simulator doing everything that you ever want to do. And uh, that's a full motion simulator on those one-to-one uh, -one courses. So that's available. Now I know you can go online and you can find places that do these simulator courses, but what we want to offer you is a really good wraparound package with it. And that's over the years I've run probably about a hundred of those. So not everybody wants to do that. And you know, sometimes it'll be a business that wants to pay for their person to go and do it because they have to travel for their work, or it could be somebody who's just said, I've had enough, or I just want the individual attention. You know, but that's available now. So all of these are on our website, which is lovefly.co.uk. And if you just click on the courses button, you can see what we've got currently going at the moment with a, with a few pictures and stuff. We'll update it and put some videos on there and stuff so you get more of a sense of how it all looks and works. Um, so anyway, that's the sales over. Right, folks. So, so great questions. Thank you very much for these. So the first question goes for, comes from Eleanor. She said, uh, "What at what point would pilots give up where it's just kind of, it's out of their control? <laughs> nice light start, by the way. Uh, at what point would they go, that's it, hands up, I've had enough, get out of control. Uh, and Gita, 
uh, Geeta Brown has given some Geeta Gold answer because she's our student pilot, so nervous flyer to student pilot. She's she often posts in the group, so you know, the superstar, and uh, she's put some nice stuff in there. So you can have a look at that. But I would just say you got to think about this, you know. So everything that the pilots do on board an aircraft is practice. So they're they're practicing. So if you think about it, and we often say this, if you when you think about your driving license, so assume you drive every six months um you get tested to, on your ability to drive your car don't you and then uh, every six months you get uh, somebody sits next to you and examines you for four hours on your driving ability and you go on skid pan and you drive in lots of different conditions and you've got a backup driver haven't you and your vehicle's got backup systems and every single day you drive your car it gets a full service and what we call in the uk an mot i mean ironic uh, none of those things happen. We, you know, I was listening to one of the things we're setting up at the moment. I was listening to one of our pilots talk about this, and he described it a bit like, you know, you get your if you get get your driving license at twenty, uh, then you can drive unbridled luxury of driving without anyone checking you for fifty years. That's in the UK. I don't know what it's like in other countries before. Anybody then says you have to fill in the form to say that you're still medically fit to drive, but it's a paperwork exercise unless your GP says actually this person is not safe to drive. Not 50 years have never been checked. Compare that with a pilot. So the thing of two things I say that is that you're being checked all, every few months on something. You the way every single thing you you do you're tested on. Every single emergency that's ever, ever happened or every scenario you're tested on every six months as well. So you always, over a couple of years, will have done everything that's possible to happen in an aircraft. And then you get tested on your ability to deal with it. And that's how it gets safer and safer and safer. The other thing is that a lot of people forget is that pilots like cabin crew, like you, got, got skin in the game. So you know we're the we're there we're on it as well so there is never a point where you'd give up because you, just your training and everything about all the redundancies all the backup systems and all everything that just drilled into you it's, it's not an easy task to become a pilot and so to get to the point where they're in a commercial aircraft that you will hear them speak from the front that's taken years and years and years and to be a captain on that aircraft so many thousands of hours, thousands of hours of flying experience. So you just you've got to sort of think about these people. It's a sort of a different mindset to what we might experience in other professions. Uh, so Elizabeth and June have asked about the Jap Japanese Airlines thing. Um, so can I come back to that one as a nice light finish? Um, so Mez asked, oh, well, I'm just going to tick those other ones so that I've ticked off Eleanor. So Mez has asked about, so are crew allowed to get up from the seats during takeoff if they were to see a passenger perhaps having a sort of like a full-blown anxiety attack or anything? So Sarah Fowler, who's also coming on the Manchester course with us and is one of our speakers as well, uh, she's done an answer in that. And, and it's pretty much what I thought, but I think as she's current crew working on Virgin at the moment, I thought it'd be inter interesting for her. Kindly, she was able to jump on and put an answer on there, which I paraphrase is basically it's safety first. So if you look at if you look at cabin crew sitting at a door, during takeoff, you need you want the overall safety of the aircraft to be the most important thing, don't you? So you need somebody by every by every door. So that's the most important thing. So regardless of what else is going on in the aircraft, safety first. However, if there's if sometimes when you look on a, a flight, you might see another person sat next to them is not they're not manning a door, so to speak. So that person is not required to buy, be by the door. So they could technically, if it was safe for them to do so, go down and help somebody. Now I'm trying to think what would go wrong in the amount of time that you actually going to be sat there doing takeoff and you think about takeoff itself to the point where you get to 1500 feet and it slightly levels off it's what a couple of minutes so even if the cabin crew person waited for a couple of minutes that's you know that would be it and then they could be attending to you so but it would be very much upon their discretion again safety first on an itchy nose and stopped mid-flow so yeah check that out that's in the um, 
So Sarah Fowler's already answered that one, but that's pretty much the sum of it. I hope that answers yours okay. Um, so Arinos has said uh, pilots, um, when they do the weather, which they find really, really helpful, is it based on the destination, you know, where they are now and where they're going to, to make us feel, to look forward to the flight, or is it based on, you know, the weather in the air? And the answer is actually all of the above. So the weather in the air is actually a prediction based on, there's a lot of modeling that goes on in terms of, you know, they, they use all the meteorology charts and they know how to read the weather and there's not just them, the pilots that do it, they also get the flight planners. And so everything, there's been a lot of thinking that's gone into this to, to give them the weather report. But when they talk about the weather, they're talking about predicted weather. So that no one knows 100% exactly what it's going to be like. We just, it's predicted. So it's a, the best, I'd say the best guess. But that's the thing is that they've got a route. They're always planning what if anyway. So it doesn't matter if there's suddenly turbulence we're expecting. It's not dangerous to the aircraft. It's just we don't like it. So none of these things are a problem. They can see things like so if a storm was to suddenly come from nowhere, I don't know how that would happen, but they can see these things. There's there's always there's always a backup plan and a backup plan, you know. So it's so what they're trying to do really is and it's kind of part of the pilot training is, is to reassure the passengers that it's it's kind of a customer service thing, like for you to sort of hear their voice, know that they're competent, they know what they're doing, and you know, to give you a sense of what's coming up. And the interesting thing is quite often people have said, if I've asked this question on quite a few podcast episodes as well and said, you know, if you if the pilots know it's going to be turbulent, do you want to know at the beginning of the flight or not? And literally half and half. And on our group, our face to face courses, it would literally if I'd say who'd want to know at the beginning of the flight, who doesn't want to know? It would be half and half because you can't please everybody, you see. And uh, some people would write to know so they can think about it and others would go, well, it might not happen so you know you say well the pilot says there was going to be turbulence two hours into the flight two hours into the flight you're obviously then bracing yourself holding the aircraft up via the arm rests and breaking your partner's arm uh, and then the turbulence doesn't come now you might think you'd be relieved but how much stress has that caused you so i would say uh it's probably better to let people know it's going to be a little bit choppy but that to also most pilots will then remember to say but it's not dangerous. But not every pilot thinks like you do, because you might think, I like the ones that chat a bit more about it. But remember, they don't, they know it's not dangerous. So it's, it's like they, it doesn't occur to them to say that, oh, yes, by the way, you know, to come on, explain what turbulence is all about. So if you ever get that from a pilot, that's fantastic. And please make a point of thanking them afterwards, because it's very lonely up the front. Bear in mind, when I used to be cabin groom, you know, a million years ago, there was, you could go into the flight deck, you could take people up to talk to the, the pilots and stuff during the flight. And they used to like that because it was a bit of interaction. Now all they get is the cabin crew popping in every 20 minutes and themselves. So that, you know, they, they like to know that what they're doing reaches people. So do, please do thank them if you get a chance to. Um, I hope I pronounced this right, Katha. So, how do pilots ensure that instruments are all set up correctly, procedures in place to correct mistakes? And and you said it's silly to ask. No, you're not silly. You, but like I said in the group, a lot of people think their questions are silly, but if you're thinking it, somebody else is. I mean, I am capable of lots of silly answers, but I promise you, there is no silly questions. So again, this is back to the point that. Um, pilots practice everything. There's, if you ever sort of sit in the flight deck, and some, sometimes I'm lucky to go into simulators, the commercial simulators, like the ones that we're able to use, and see the pilots practice things. Nobody does anything without checking with the other one. So they don't touch a switch, they don't move a dial, they don't do anything without saying, I'm about to do this, and the other one verifies. And then when they've done it, they also verify that. So they're always talking to each other, which is something we call as an element of human factors. And if you want to know more about that, that's one of the very early podcast episodes with David Gott, uh, which is actually quite a popular one. So if you want to listen to that one, in, it's in one of the very first, in the first 10 podcast episodes. But that is the human factors idea, communicating and making sure that we allow for that human error side of it. So that's, you know, that's a thing. 
but everything that you you know when you think a pilot goes and works so one of the things that a lot of people don't know about pilots is that you can only operate one type at a time so i was talking to a concord pilot the other day it's going to be one of the future podcasts coming up and he went from flying the Concorde to the triple uh, to the A330, and then he went to the triple seven. And when he went to the as as he moved from each aircraft type to the next one, it was between three to six months of training, even though they're a qualified pilot with thousands of hours. But to move to another aircraft type, you have to give up the one that you're on, and then almost retrain, and get retested etc and in the simulator again are tested again before you're allowed to fly this new aircraft type so that they're very well drilled in it and one of the things that one of our pilots used to demonstrate on the face-to-face course is a lovely guy called pete, pete leg who's used to one of the podcasts he used to say right he can close his eyes put his hand up and he knows exactly what he's touching he knows where everything is so when you go into if you ever go into a modern flight deck it's like mind-blowing but everything's duplicated as well. So you, when you look at it, it's, there's t- two of everything. All the switches are duplicated, at least. So that then takes away half. But they literally know where everything is. They're, they're drilled. They're drilled. Like, so hopefully that, that helps with that one. Um, so Julie's asked a question about um, how many flights per year encounter engine malfunction and also severe turbulence. So I'll take those separately. So I can't. So the engine malfunction thing, I'm not a pilot. Okay, so when I've asked pilots this, most of them, so for example, the guy, the Concorde pilot, that when he came on to the the Airbus and the triple, then on to the 777, the Boeing, he said that in the 20 years that he flew those two, he never had an engine failure, never. But his dad, who was also a pilot, said it was kind of like, it's part of the job. So his dad had been flying many years before, and there were always four engine aircraft. And it was like a common thing. So every month he'd say, oh, yeah, we have to dial back one of the engines, or it overheated a bit. And it was like, but as the technology's improved, it's got so ridiculously safe now, and tested, and manufactured, and engineered to such precision that now they can fly, you know, a, a two-engined aircraft, can carry an aircraft, it can carry the, the fuselage, which is almost the weight of one of the first 747s, which was like a four engine thing. So the these engines are so powerful now, so reliable, that it's getting safer and safer all the time. So that hopefully that answers that one. It's not to say that anything happens, but every pilot I've ever asked has said, most would say I've never had an engine failure. But the worst they say is had one that was playing up a bit, so we just dialed it down a bit. But... There's really strict rules about how far you can fly. And, you know, if you've got four engines, then you can, can you, have you still got enough power and fuel, et cetera, to complete the rest of the journey? You know, because the A380 still has four engines. Uh, if you've got a twin operation, there's really strict rules around that, which I won't bore you with because that's on one of the podcasts, I think, with Captain Dave Mabbott. So go and check that one out. Right, so let's come to the Japanese airline one. Okay, so Elizabeth and June have asked about this. Uh, Joanne did a great reply. So thanks, Joanne. I really love that. It was really positive and very realistic and pragmatic. I love that. So um, please check that out. That's in the Love Fly Facebook group if you're, you're watching this on YouTube. Now, obviously the question is what's happened? What on earth has happened there? So let's draw the positive. So the A350 is a fantastic aircraft, okay? A fantastic aircraft. And with as with all aircraft types, all commercial aircraft types, you have to be able to evacuate them in 90 seconds with half of the doors shut, you know, not, not working. Get everybody out in 90 seconds, even with doors that won't open, which they did, okay? So that's the way that all aircraft are manufactured and tested, that you've got to be, the crew have got to be able to get everybody out within 90 seconds, even if a door is blocked, okay? They did that. Sadly, the, the Coast Guard aircraft, we don't know what happened there, and some people lost their lives, which is obviously very tragic for them. I can't comment on that part. It's just very sad. The bit that I loved, Airbus did a release, and they said, we will communicate more information when we know more. And I think that's got to be the line. Because at the moment, I had a look on... Um, 
I won't say who it is, so I'll just give the initials BBC. Uh, even on such a sort of reputable media station as that, they've got people coming on making comments who are like such and such in London, and this person who's an expert in that. They're desperate for news. But the reality is, this is what aircraft investigation is all about. Everybody will know about this. The only people I'd say it's safe to speculate about this, and it's not you. I know some people like to know. I've got to know. I've got to watch everything. But I don't think it helps you because some, some of the images are quite horrible to look at, even though everyone got off that particular aircraft. If you look at the aircraft and what's happened to it, it's just going to send you into a bit of a you know spiral. So I would say do not read any of that. Do not look at any of it. You don't have to look at it. I know it's everywhere and it'll probably be in your feed because you might have Googled it in the past. But the only people I think it's safe to speculate about what's happened would be Airbus pilots because they will be doing that all around the country and around the world right now. Anyone who flies the Airbus and particularly the A350 will be going, oh, well, not happened there. Other pilots will also be doing it who fly other aircraft types because other aircraft types are available. But they're the only ones that can do it from a position of intellectual curiosity because it's not going to trigger them. They're just going to be curious on what happened there. So we'll learn from what they did well. If there's any mistakes that happened, they could have done it even better. They'll, that'll be published. Everybody will know who flies that aircraft type and anyone who flies commercially will all know about it. But if you start to investigate it, unless you are a fearless flyer, all you're going to do is create more what ifs, what ifs. So if you can, give yourself permission just to go, this will be investigated as they always are. Anything that ever happens is properly investigated and it's made public. And then any mistakes or anything that can be learned from for everybody will be shared across the industry. It doesn't matter who the manufacturer is. I just think the Japanese crew were amazing. They, they did their training, they got everybody out, and that's what they're supposed to do. So whatever happened, they did their job. I think that's it. <laughs> I don't know if that's a mic drop or if it's a shut up or that's enough. Uh, stop talking about the yes. So I'm just going to have a quick look on Facebook, see if there's any other questions come up. Um, yeah, so David Gott just said uh, there's there's more. So David Gott's quite rightly saying um, he's answering a question by Brian Morris. Hi, Brian. Nice to hear from you again. And he says, there have been more reports of extreme turbulence recently. Does this have anything to do with global warming or what do you think it is? And David Gott's done a great answer here. He says, I don't think it's a case of more occurrences, more, but more reporting by the media. There's also social media where things are posted there and the media then pick up on those stories very quickly. Yeah, nicely put, David. That's great. And David's the one that I said earlier on, is did the, um, the Human Factors podcast very early in the... Um, uh, the early episodes and he worked with me for years and years and years and he's going to be working with us when we start running our courses down at Gatwick which we're hoping to do in the nearish future but um, that's just not that we've got a few things to iron out on that front but yeah we will be doing the equivalent of the Manchester course in Gatwick as well and uh, maybe other places who said who knows we'll just have to see how it goes we've got lots and lots of plans so thank you very much again for tuning in and uh, also say hello to Pete Higgins. So Pete Higgins, so you know, if you haven't found it, check out the flight checklist. People rave about this. The Pete Higgins flight checklist, which is in the files, media or guide section of the Love Fly Facebook group, which I know some of you are watching on this right now, but not everybody watches through this medium. And if you go on to there, you'll see that Pete has gifted this fantastic thing, which is every stage of the flight and so many people i mean it's been downloaded well, I, I had it used to have it on a, a, a platform called calameo and i think i noticed it had been downloaded like four or five thousand times before i turned it off there and it's just in one place now i mean just amazing so thank you pete and pete i mean the reason i mentioned pete is pete always sends me a little report afterwards so if he didn't know that I wouldn't do this, you know, that's I need I need the I need the acknowledgement. So Pete always sends me a little run through, like, well, I like the answer to this question. I think you could have said a bit of this. So uh, yes, I'm looking forward to your feedback, Pete, as always. And keep recommending people, keep doing the support that you're doing for each other. It's just phenomenal. We just it blows us away at Love Fly how much it, everybody helps each other out. Because, like I say, 
you know, we were talking in the end of year podcast, which I said is coming out on front Wednesday. Uh, so oh, it's tomorrow, isn't it? Um, how often when we get on to go and answer something, somebody's already gone there and, and you know, you'll see some of the, the well-known people coming up time and time again. But there's just some amazing amazing support in lots of the places that we operate so thank you for doing what you do so i'm going to bugger off now and i should wish you good evening or good afternoon or wherever you are time zone wise and uh, i look forward to speaking to you tomorrow in the podcast and i'll catch you next week for the fear of flying q a and again if you are looking to get some face-to-face help we would love to see you at manchester on the 13th of april if you can make it